Master Series, uh, season 22 or something of this famous <clears throat> series. Um, this is the first of six general lectures that we'll be holding. And there's also the Solidarity Dialogues uh, series of five that will be on the Tuesday, Thursday slots at this time. And so just generally orienting you, if you're with us for the first time. Um, at this time, always at this time, there will be something. On Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, it's general lectures. On Tuesday, Thursdays, it's the Solidarity uh, Dialogue series. And on Saturdays, mainly tomorrow and a week from tomorrow, it's the Saturday Night at the Movies uh, series. And the poster for that just went up in the website. Um, and you can see it tomorrow. There's I'm just announcing tomorrow's because it came a bit late. The announcement of an evening of short film with Masha Gadavanlaya, one of our teachers who's also a filmmaker, and we'll be showing some of her short films and talking about them. It's going to be really interesting. Um, but now let's go to today's lecture. So today's lecture, um, we have Carlos Tacuba and Papi Slocum, Car um, and they are old friends of NYI. Uh, in the in-person version in St. Petersburg, both of them took part in that several times. And so it's great to have you guys back. Thank you for doing this. Um, uh, let me just say a couple words about each of them in alphabetical order of last names, starting with Carl Stikuba, um, who has a PhD in linguistics from Stony Brook University um, and has taught at various places, Pomona College, Calgary, University of Calgary, Queens College. And he is currently associate professor, professor of speech communication in the Department of Communications and Performing Arts which I find interesting, at Kingsborough Community College, um, and uh, where he teaches linguistics and speech communication. And he has done a lot of research on theoretical linguistics um, and applied linguistics. Um, and he is also now working in the area of equity in the classroom, um, issues of language and ideology. Um, and uh, he and Poppy Slocum have been working together on this topic quite a bit. Poppy is Associate Professor of Communication Studies at LaGuardia Community College. She also has a PhD in linguistics from Stony Brook University. Um, and she is committed to applying sociolinguistic theory to her teaching uh, and working to help others to do the same by showing how basic linguistic principles that all languages and dialects are equally communicatively valid um, and the consequences of this for wide range of teaching. I think we'll be hearing about that um, today in their talk. Uh, it's where they're going to tell us about cog meets cult, linguistic justice in education. Thank you guys for starting off our series and let's welcome our speakers and take it away. Thank you so much, John. Um, this is so exciting. Yeah, so Carlos and I, um, it's been a while. I was last at NYI in 2013 and Carlos was in 2010. Um, so we're delighted to be back and in this new exciting format. This is really cool. Um, and John already said a lot of, of what I was thinking for our intro, right? So Carlos and I both started off, um, and Carlos more so still is, uh, as theoretical linguists. And we got hired in communication studies departments, which you know you don't typically think of as being the dream for a linguist, right? Going into com studies, which is more on the cult side. Um, but it's been really, really fantastic. And, and we've both been really delighted to be there because we've seen that there is such a deep need for connection between the fields and um, for the kind of things, you know, the NYI has been doing for years is drawing this connections. So what we're going to be doing is talking a little bit about why all fields need linguistics for um, purposes of linguistic justice, right? And why it really lands on the responsibility on a linguist to get out there and get into different fields and to uh, share some of the basic findings of the field. So I know we have a really mixed group we're here right now. Some of you are very familiar with linguistics. Um, some of you are sort of just getting to know it, probably here at NYI for the first time, maybe. Um, so we're really, the, the, the linguistic background needed for our talk is really minimal, but we're still going to go through it just a little bit to um, make sure everyone is on the same page. Let me share my screen. 
All right. I'm going to share all of our slides with you also, which have our emails and all that good stuff. In fact, I will pop them in the chat right now, maybe also at the end. So you have them for reference and contact if you need. Um, all right, so, so today what we're going to do is talk about, if I can figure out how this works, here we go. Um, three related problems in linguistics. And before we do that, we'll give a little bit of background and standard language ideology and what that is. Um, and then we'll apply that to linguistic discrimination in education, which um, we've become very familiar with and talk about why that's related to the reduced profile or influence of linguistic linguistics in academia. Um, and also how in order to address these issues, we need to rethink colonial thinking and behavior and linguistics, and then talk about some of the things we've been doing that we think that you can do too. So we think that regardless of whether you are, you know, in a, a linguist or not, or an undergrad or a professor or anywhere in between, we hope there's something in here that will be applicable for you and your life. Um, so starting out just with some basics in uh, ideology, right? So this is taken from Lippy Green, sort of seminal work in linguistic ideology, in standard language ideology. So ideology is just very broadly, right, across um, fields, the promotion of the needs and interests of a dominant group or class at the expense of marginalized groups by means of disinformation and misrepresentation of those non-dominant groups. Right. So when applied to language, standard language ideology is a bias towards an abstracted, idealized, hom homogeneous spoken language, which is imposed and maintained by the dominant block institutions and which names as its model the written language, but which is drawn primarily from the spoken language of the upper middle class. Right. We're going to be talking a lot about English today, but this applies to most languages I've yet to find. <laughs> uh, if anyone knows actually of um, an, a language that does not have some sort of standard, standard language ideology, I'd love to hear about it, right? And the result of this standard language ideology is what Lippy Green calls the standard language myth, right? Um, and this is a myth that, that a standard language exists, right? Um, and that it is some sort of superior version of that language, right? But in fact, there is no such thing as a standard language, right? It's an abstraction and languages, as we know, they constantly change and variation is always present and normal. Um, and there's no such thing as someone who doesn't have an accent or an unaccented variety of a language, right? Um, and also that uh, this, there's this idea that accents are sort of easy to change. They're not. Right, and therefore, someone's accent, if taken as being, um, <laughs> I think someone's brushing their teeth, which is very awesome. I'm just all right. <laughs> the joys of, of Zoom lectures, I love it. I love that you can listen to this in, in all these different contexts, right? It's great. Um, uh, so everyone has an accent, and uh, if the accent is if we assume that an accent is something that's kind of easy to change, right, then it's easy to judge people for their accent, right? Obviously, well, why don't you just speak differently? Well, it's not that simple. And there, there's lots and lots of evidence for that, Just, but it, it's still um, really commonly held belief that, that, that um, someone's accent is their own personal strength or failing, right? Um, which leads to linguistic discrimination, right? So. Linguists know well that linguistic discrimination is prejudice, right? Um, because as Reeser et al. puts it, no variety of a language is inherently better in terms of its logic, its systematic structure, or its ability to express creative and complex thought, right? So linguistic discrimination is not based in science, but on social prejudice and often racism, right? So these are really well-documented truths that are just not commonly held beliefs in society, right? Linguistic discrimination is one of the, like, the, the last acceptable forms of discrimination where people will readily defend it and say, 
um, make arguments that linguistic discrimination should exist and that it's somehow necessary for an orderly society. Um, so how does that still exist? The myth of the standard language persists because it is carefully tended and propagated with huge, almost universal success so that language, the most fundamental of human socialization tools becomes a commodity. This is the core of an ideology of standardization which empowers certain individuals and institutions to make these decisions and impose them on others, right? Um, so for those of you for whom this is maybe relatively new, we wanna give you a couple of really just concrete examples just to hammer this down. And for those of you who are um, well versed in these ideas, we think these are examples are like really good at changing people's minds. So for, if, if this is new to, if this is not new to you, just take these examples and use them in everyday life because they work great. First one, beautiful, beautiful examples are dropping. Right? So this is a common process in many varieties of English. So only pronouncing one R in brother um, or a none in pot, party, potty, pot, excuse me, park, I'm not, I'm, I won't try, um, and car, right? And this pronunciation is extremely stigmatized in New York City English, in African American English, in Boston English, and more, right? But in the UK, it's prestigious. Right. So I have lots of students of mine who um, are New York speakers of New York City English who, who uh, quote, don't pronounce their R's, they say, and they say, well, I think I'm just lazy, you know, I think, I don't know, I'm just, I just don't, I'm, I'm just kind of lazy sometimes when I speak and I drop it, right, and they see it as an internal deficit. Right, and we do a couple of exercises and compare it to British English and I say, hmm. Do you think anyone tells the Queen of England that she's lazy? Do you think they think she is lazy when she's speaking? No, no, oh, look, oh, she, she drops her R's in the exact same place as you do. What do you know, right? So just a really nice concrete example that um, linguistic discrimination is social prejudice and not some sort of deficit, right? The, um, Another one that we like to talk about is um, comes from more of a historical perspective, and this is a common pronunciation of ask in English, which is ax. And ax, if you don't know, is a highly, highly stigmatized um, variety uh, pronunciation of ask. So it's sometimes used as, as a class shibboleth for race and class, um, meaning that you know, it, if someone says it, then they're automatically uses that pronunciation. Then a sub broad assumptions are automatically made about their um, their class and and their race. Um, and in fact, ax is the older pronunciation, right? So for all people who like to say, well, language shouldn't change, and the way it was pronounced is the way it should be pronounced, right? We say, oh, really? Well, then we should all be saying ax. Right, because that was before metathesis brought us the pronunciation of ask, right? It's the same sort of process that brought us um, bird from brid and wasp from wasp and now often professor from professor, right? So this is just a product of a, of a, common, um, a common phonological change. Okay. Um, one last one. It's pretty good from um, syntax now is double negation, right? So uh, I didn't say nothing is the stigmatized variety in English. And um, English speakers are often told, no, it's not, you didn't say nothing. It's I didn't say anything because if you have two negatives then it makes a positive, right? Like in math. And so that should mean I did say something, right? Um, but of course, Double negation in, um, is common in many, many varieties. And so then you can say, wait a second, so what about for the French or the Spanish or for older varieties of English? Were they all wrong? Does French, is French illogical? Is Spanish illogical, right? Are these languages, do they make no sense? And then of course, in the other direction also, if, you, if we have any French speakers in here, um, French speakers are also, often um, corrected, oh, you can't drop the n, you must drop the, you mustn't drop the n, you have to say n, right, the, the first part of the um, negation. And that, of course, is the exact opposite of what 
prescriptivists argue in, in English, right? So um, these few examples are often enough to start to crumble the foundations of people's uh, ideas about um, the value of linguistic discrimination and, and uh, standard language ideology. Right? Um, so that's sort of the basics. And now we're going to bring it into education because in education is often where a lot of standard, standard ideology is propagated and um, reinforced, right? And this is through a particular, um, a particular approach to language variation called uh, the deficit view on dialectal variation, right? And so this is the approach that says, you know, certain varieties of English are prestigious and others are deficient or incorrect or illogical or slang or broken, right? Um, that there should be only one variety of English, the so-called standard, which is appropriate for the classroom. Um, and in the US, the sort of terms you often hear, are, oh, well, we're trying to enforce either standard English or academic English or the language of wider communication, right? And these are all kind of euphemistic uh, terms for, you know, um, white, middle, upper class English. Um, and these terms are usually socially constructed and rooted in racism and prejudice, right? So people will try to sidestep them with different things. Oh, we're just talking about academic English. It's the, it's, it's, it's not about who speaks it. It's just, this is the education, the language of education, right? Um, but it doesn't take much to sort of un unravel those euphemisms. Right? So other varieties of English are um, undervalued as discussed by Young et al, right? And we were say undervalued because all dialects and languages are inherently equally valuable despite racist educational policies that have been enacted. So undervalued varieties are seen as inferior despite as we've just seen a little bit of overwhelming evidence from disparate fields showing that all varieties are equally rule-based and valid. Um, so in the US, this might undervalued varieties might be African-American English, Appalachian English, Chicano English, Hawaiian Creole English, <clears throat> white working class English, and the Englishes of many bilingual speakers um, among other countless varieties. Um, <clears throat> and the consequences of this deficit approach is are really wide ranging and problematic for students. So, right, we have peer pressure and identity issues faced by students. So do I speak sort of my, my home dialect or this or someone else's dialect that I'm supposed to use in school? Um, negative attitudes of teachers towards speakers of undervalued the undervalued varieties, which create self-fulfilling prophecies, right? And lots of research has shown that these views are detrimental to students learning and literacy, right? So again, creating self-fulfilling prophecies. Right? Um, so Catherine Awe um, in 2008 says, I believe that rejecting students' home language is tantamount to rejecting the students themselves, as suggested both by research and personal experience. The students' home languages, including Hawaiian Creole English, in this case, must be acknowledged and treated with dignity and respect. Right? And Resort all says, when deficit views of language persist in school settings, they harm students who, given society's current language norms, are most in need of linguistically sensitive pedagogies. Right? Um, so now we're already starting to see how this isn't just a problem for linguistics, right? This is a problem for all fields because all fields teach using language and expect some sort of linguistic response, like written or oral responses and judgment about those responses are, is usually and often made um, using false ideas about language and the standard language myth, right? Um, so what does this actually look like in teaching, right? It might look like verbal correction. It's not ax, it's ask, which is not a good way to correct students, but a good way to shut them up and make them stop participating, right? Um, uh, just general accent or dialect policing, uh, assessment rubrics, this we see a lot and Carlos and I are doing um, a lot of work on. So uh, rubrics that ask for appropriate grammar and proper grammar, right? We talk to biology professors who are 
assessing people and, and feel like, well, it's my job. I have to correct for their grammar and their, uh, you know, pronunciation in their speeches because that's what's in the rubric, right? That's what they're being asked to do. Um, and in syllabi, statements like academic English must be used at all time, um, calling dialectal variations errors, and just generally privileging one language dialect variety over another. Um, so as I've said, we're talking um, about the US, but just briefly, we obviously this is a problem internationally, right? So in Vietnamese, administrators and teachers stigmatized value of minority languages as well as the minority students' practices of their ethnic languages um, and Vietnamese and glorified the value and position of Vietnamese and English compared to minority languages, right? In Italian, uh, linguistic insecurity increases the feeling of being discriminated against and lowers the self-regard regard scores of the students in Italian classrooms. I mean, just a small sampling to show this is happening, right, all over the world, right? So what is the alternative? Um, so the alternative is called the difference view, right, as opposed to the deficit view of dialectal variation. So it acknowledges the grammatical status of all languages and dialects and holding that there's no singular correct language. Um, this has been accepted in the field of linguistics for over 50 years um, and generally just rejects the standard language myth. Right? Um, and it has been shared by the Conference on College Composition and Communication since their 1974 re resolution on the student's right to their own language. Um, and was also adopted in modified form by the National Council of Teachers of English. Uh, it was reaffirmed in November 2014 and reinforced by a recent CCCC statement. This ain't another statement. This is a demand for Black linguistic justice. Um, so it's, it has some traction, right? People are recognizing the need for students' home languages, but it really hasn't gotten very far, right? Which is why we're here talking to you about it, because many, many people still believe the standard language myth, and many, many teachers do also, right? So Carlos and I um, did a study of public speaking textbooks. And if you didn't know, in the US, a lot of students in college take public speaking classes, a lot more than take linguistics classes, right? Um, and 71% of the textbooks treated language variation as errors, um, saying things like, bad grammar is much like having a bit of spinach in your front teeth, or some business and professional people find improper English as offensive as body order or food stains on the front of the shirt, or just more broadly, um, having lists of common mispronunciations, common mispronunciations that were all dialectal variants, because guess what? If a mispronunciation is common, it's probably from another dialect. Right. Otherwise, it's a slip of a tongue and it's not common. It's funny. That's great. That's different. Right. Um, so also note the other 29 percent. It's not like they were doing a great job. They just didn't mention language variation at all. There was one that did a decent job. One out of the, uh, I think, 17 common textbooks that we um, that we surveyed. Right. All right. So guess what? This is really harmful to students. So when academic spaces treat dialect variation with disdain and hostility, it's the students who suffer, as has been discussed by numerous researchers. You can check our references at the end if you want a reading list, right? It's, it's well established. Um, all right. And so this then connects to the second problem, right? which is why linguistics really hasn't been doing enough about this. I mean, it, it, um, we're not trying to say we're the only people talking about this, right? We're not. There, there is absolutely uh, a movement to, but we need to just get louder as a field. So I'm going to hand it over to Carlos to talk more about that. OK, so thanks, Poppy. Um, so um, the second problem that I'm going to go through here um, uh, actually comes from a, um, an LSA address in 2007 from Mark Lieberman. Um, and uh, he was 
uh, discussing the reduced profile and influence of uh, linguistics uh, historically um, and uh, how it arose uh, that linguistics is less influential now than it used to be. Um, so uh, according to, to Lieberman uh, in his 2007 address, uh, the, the linguistics has lost relevance uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one of them being a narrow definition of the field. So what, uh, what researchers consider as real, real research. Um, uh, sectarian squabbling in public, which uh, in linguistics happens a lot, it seems. Um, and uh, an emphasis on research over teaching um, and uh, little effective lobbying and PR on behalf of the discipline. So in a sense, we've seeded a lot of um, the things that should be part of our portfolio to uh, the general public to uh, discuss uh, influential. Oh, Poppy, yeah, thanks. Um, so according to Lieberman, um, there's uh, uh, there are certain results of this lack of um, uh, stature in linguistics. Um, so according to, to Lieberman, the discipline of linguistics is now small, weak, and inward looking. Um, so only a tiny fraction of American students get uh, any useful instruction in langu language analysis. Um, so as Poppy was saying, much, many more people will take a public speaking class than will ever take a linguistics class. Um, and uh, Lieberman guessed that maybe one in 50 people would get, uh, students would get uh, some sort of discussion of language analysis. Um, and uh, future teachers then learn nothing about English pronunciation, orthography, sentence structure, history, or importantly for our purposes here, dialect variation. Um, and as you're probably all familiar with, um, public discourse on language and communication is dominated by often uninformed non-linguists. Um, so uh, the standard language ideology has not been uh, debunked and it's still rampant. Um, and of course, the, the, the same is another uh, same is true in other arenas, um, including the uh, the academy, which is also what we're focusing on. So um, a related problem to this for linguistics is kind of uh, colonial thinking and behavior that's uh, happened and uh, with linguistics over uh, the years. So as noted by Charity Hudley et al, uh, the discipline of linguistics has a uh, quote, dismal record of racial diversity. So the LSA's 2018 annual report states, the population of ethnic minorities with advanced degrees in linguistics is so low in the US that few federal agencies report data for these groups. Um, and so Charity Hudley go on to, to discuss, uh, Charity Hudley at, at all go on to discuss severe underrepresentation for faculty and students of color in linguistics, especially those who are African American, Latinx, um, Native American, um, and uh, also uh, with Asian American and Pacific Islander groups as well. So um, Charity Hudley, in a, a recent book uh, with uh, Christine Mollinson and, and Mary Buchholz um, discusses this and um, uh, promotes linguistic, what we'll call linguistic reparations. And this comes from uh, not just Charity Hudley uh, and colleagues, but also from uh, some of the larger figures in the field of linguistics. So um, in 1982, uh, Labov stated the principle of debt incurred, um, uh, which reads, an investigator who has obtained linguistic data from members of a speech community has an obligation to use the knowledge based on that data for the benefit of the community when it has need of it, um, which is something that for a long time in linguistics, uh, we haven't done. We haven't uh, um, helped the communities that we're mining data from. Um, and he also, uh, in the same uh, at the same time came up with the principle of error correction, which is a scientist who becomes aware of a widespread idea or social practice with important consequences that is invalidated by their own data um, is obligated to bring this error to the attention of the widest possible audience. And that's the kind of stuff that we've been trying to do and what we're trying to encourage uh, a lot of other people to, uh, to do, specifically linguists. 
Um, similarly, uh, Walt Wolfram came up with the principle of linguistic gratuity, uh, which reads, investigators who have obtained linguistic data from members of a speech community should actively pursue ways they can return linguistic favors to the community. And finally, um, John Rickford uh, uh, in a 1997 article says, American quantitative social sociolinguistics has over the past quarter century drawn substantially on data from African-American vernacular English and the African-American speech community for its descriptive theoretical methodological development, but given rel relatively little back to the community in terms of representation or practical application in education and other domains such as law. And again, he similarly proposed the principle of service in return, which urges linguists to center black humanity as a, a moral imperative. So we've laid out, uh, you know, these these three problems that that we see, and and obviously that we think that they're all kind of uh, related to each other. Um, so we'd like to propose some some solutions and talk a little bit about things that we're trying to do uh, to uh, to promote different thinking. So going back to Lieberman's LSA talk, um, he came up with a, some elements of a plan to kind of revive the stature of linguistics. And some of the things uh, that he proposed I've included here. So he says we should take an inclusive attitude. So nothing linguistic is outside of this disciplinary tent and non-linguists are welcome collaborators. Um, and also we should focus on undergraduate education, um, improve relations with other departments or or just establish them uh, at a minimum, um, and promote and value public policy discussions, things that uh, we do some of, but certainly not enough of. Um, and another solution uh, that we see is, um, again, in this interdisciplinary work, um, not just uh, being sort of siloed linguistics departments, but dealing with other uh, issues um, with other disciplines. Um, so uh, another quote here from, from Charity Hudley et al. Um, it is essential for linguistics as a discipline to learn from the interdisciplinary fields that have as their raison d'etre, central critical engagement with race and racism, such as black studies, indigenous studies, Latinx studies, Asian American and Pacific and Islander studies. Um, the failure of linguistics to engage seriously with the cutting edge theoretical and political perspectives that these fields offer has significantly hampered linguists, linguists ability to address questions of race and racism in our scholarship, in our academic discipline and our profession. So we want to sort of uh, emphasize this with the, the title of our 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 talk um, that the co the cog and occult side need to uh, come together and linguists need to um, engage with the culture side uh, more than they have been doing. Okay, so. Um, Things that uh, Poppy and I have done, and also uh, we we work with our colleague Laura Spinu um, uh, for uh, on some of this work as well, who's at Kingsborough Community College. Um, so we've all uh, worked together on uh, one solution, which is professional dissemination. So just getting out there to scholarly conferences and um, exposing myths underpinning linguistic discrimination to those who are uh, unfamiliar with them. Um, so we've done it at a bunch of communications conferences and also at the CUNY Faculty Diversity and Inclusion Conference, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, in addition, we're also uh, targeting linguistics conferences, um, uh, such as the LSA in 2020 and 2022, uh, this uh, Southeastern uh, 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 Conference on Linguistics um, and the International Linguistics Association, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this has showed um, us that there's a need for this work, not just with um, non-linguists, but with, with linguists as well, um, because um, a lot of linguists who are out there working um, that we've encountered in, in our discussions, um, don't they sort of fall along with the standard language ideology even though uh, they're linguists. Okay, so through one of those uh, conferences, the National Communication Associations uh, Conference that uh, Poppy and I attended, um, 
we actually had a, a someone in the audience who was uh, working for um, a uh, uh, a big publisher, Macmillan, of public speaking books, and we were invited to be um, uh, reviewers uh, to for issues of uh, uh, diversity and inclusion um, in their uh, textbook. So we reviewed the textbook um, and uh, we got them to eliminate some problematic lists of commonly mispronounced words, which again, were mostly just a dialectal variation. Um, and uh, we got them to stop categorizing uh, uh, differently pronounced words as being incorrect. Um, and on their website, they even uh, a added um, that, in fact, there's no single standard of English. Everyone speaks with a dialect, and the public speaking classroom should be inclusive of dialects and accents. Um, so uh, they were quite receptive to, uh, to the changes that we suggested in the, um, uh, in the review. Um, and so we hope to do some more of this kind of work. So it shows that that there is an appetite out there for this kind of work. And we don't just have to throw up our arms and, and do nothing, but we can actually work to make some change. OK, another thing that we, we do um, is we try to uh, redesign uh, curricula. Um, so our colleague, Laura Spina, who uh, we just mentioned, um, got a, a course called Voice and Articulation as one of the things she was teaching in the, the speech uh, communication uh, program. Um, and it was mostly just talking about uh, um, things like problematic New York English um, and how to fix things, right? Um, and she redesigned the course to make it more uh, of a uh, phonetic analysis class, um, you know, than uh, being some sort of prescriptive, this is the way you need to, uh, to talk. Um, I've also uh, just started at Kingsborough. There was no um, linguistics courses at Kingsborough uh, before, so I started an intro to linguistics course just this past semester at Kingsborough, and I made it uh, diversity focused. Um, and uh, Poppy has also worked uh, at Brooklyn College um, uh, for teaching uh, future teachers um, and uh, also focuses uh, them on language uh, diversity as well. And if you're interested in, in um, improving uh, the uh, inclusiveness of your Intro to Linguistics class, a good place to start is Kendra Calhoun's uh, and uh, co-authors uh, 2021 paper um, on a Black-centered introduction to linguistics course. OK, we also work on um, uh, some uh, professional development seminars. Um, so uh, I'll just focus on uh, one that I do, uh, although Poppy has done a little bit of work in this uh, area as well. Um, and so I uh, started uh, ling Linguistic Diversity in the Classroom, FIG. So FIG is a what's called a faculty interest group. And at Kingsborough Community College, where I work, um, they have these uh, groups that will meet with uh, professors to discuss pedagogical issues. And there was a, uh, one of them was uh, called a um, uh, culturally responsive teaching. And I asked if I could take it over and uh, focus on linguistic diversity in the, in the classroom. So I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Um, and um, in the first year, we went, we read through a book uh, called Other People's English. Um, and then uh, this past year, we just finished up with Linguistic Justice. And uh, next semester, I'm looking at uh, Talking College. And so uh, what we do is we'll meet a few times a semester, probably usually four times a semester. And um, then uh, we'll discuss the, uh, the books. Um, so you can go to the next one, Poppy. Thanks. Okay, so we tend to meet four times a semester, um, one hour sessions. Um, usually I'll start uh, just by like Poppy kind of started here talking about the standard language uh, myth and standard language ideology um, and give examples, de debunking dialect myths. So, um, so if you're interested in doing this stuff, you already have the blueprints to get it started from, uh, from Poppy's section earlier. Um, and uh, then I provide some discussion questions to get conversations going and share relevant video links um, having to do with linguistic uh, discrimination uh, between sessions. Um, and yeah, one of them I'll just highlight is uh, who is academia really for? There's a, uh, a link for that in the uh, 
in the references of the talk. Um, and it uh, is a good one to connect with uh, with students and with faculty um, to see how uh, uh, someone who has gone through school thinks of linguistic discrimination. OK, and then just quickly, we usually get I usually get somewhere between four and 10 attendees per session um, and participants have included both faculty and staff. Um, we've, we have some excellent uh, conversations, including difficult ones when teachers realize that they've been doing in the classroom things that could be harmful to their students. It's kind of rough, but, uh, um, but it also motivates them to uh, uh, make pedagogical changes and work towards linguistic justice. And again, none of these are linguistics professors. These are all uh, you know, from all different uh, disciplines. Um, and uh, again, students or the, the faculty who were in there were motivated enough to, to join uh, Poppy and, uh, and Laura and I in facilitating a language diversity workshop, even though that's not, you know, linguistics is not their area. Um, so, uh, so people are maybe more responsive to this than you might think initially. So I got some good feedback. Um, uh, I'll just read a couple of them. So uh, talking about the FIG, it helped me broaden my own disciplinary perspectives and expanded in my classrooms. And there have been many moments where, where we have been able to dis, uh, share ideas about how to integrate language diversity in, into our teaching practices and uh, materials. And we can skip through these, I think. Okay, so by doing this fig, I've raised the profile of language diversity on, on our campus, and there was zero profile before I uh, I got there. Um, so you could probably have similar kinds of uh, success in, in in getting change. Um, and by doing this, it enables enables me to raise my profile a little bit um, by participating in panel discussions on uh, different uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion issues on campus and uh, keeping the focus on uh, linguistic discrimination uh, out there for, for people. Okay, so if you want to do this kind of work, uh, well, uh, what should you do? So the first uh, comes from Kendrick Lamar, uh, who says to us all, be humble, right? Um, so uh, what do I mean by that? Well, the nature of this work is interdisciplinary. Um, so Wolfram and Dunstan have done this, this kind of work before, and the way they describe it um, is that it was not simply an elite group of linguists who set themselves apart as the exclusive experts on issue of language variation. Instead, the program coordinators represent uh, uh, colleges and faculty administrative roles at the university, uh, thus offering different perspectives, disciplinary affiliations, and administrative networks for the program, leading to a campus infusion model. So going forward with our work, we're following this. And, and again, we need to be open to people from other uh, disciplines and uh, realize that we can learn from people from different disciplines. We don't know it all. So we can also recommend uh, for everyone to do some reading outside of linguistics. So just a, a few example books here. There's plenty more that you can uh, look for. Um, but uh, if you're interested in getting into this kind of work, Amber Cabral's Allies and Advocates is a, a, a good entryway. Um, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist from uh, Ibram X. Kendi is good. And White Fragility um, by Robin DiAngelo. Um, just to get uh, your chops up a little bit on, uh, on issues of, uh, of race. And also, if you're interested in uh, things like we're talking about now, there's there are two whole volumes uh, coming out. Um, so uh, Oxford Collections on Inclusion and Decolonization in Linguistics, um, edited by uh, Anne Charity Hudley, Christine Mollinson, and Mary Buchholz. Um, and taken as a set, the, the two volumes will have the potential to transform linguistic practice by setting frameworks for the discipline's professional growth, and will help researchers establish innovative research agendas uh, for years to come. So this will probably be um, out sometime next year-ish, and, and uh, so hopefully sooner, but uh, these things take time. Um, and, uh, and Poppy and I, along with Laura, do have a, a paper under review uh, for this uh, as well. So look out for that eventually. OK, so the first one is inclusion in linguistics. Um, and uh, 
uh, then, and I won't go into it too much. And the next one is um, decolonizing linguistics. So again, uh, the you know you have the, these slides now, so you can look in and see what you're uh, what you're in for for these. And um, again, look out for them, and they can. Uh, We've had an, uh, the opportunity to, to read some of the papers by our uh, other authors because we're trading them back and forth. And so there's really great stuff uh, coming. Okay, so we also have some recommendations for the field in general, um, you know, following uh, along with the guidelines of Lieberman earlier. Um, we think that um, we need to change the reward systems in tenure and promotion to actually uh, reward things like teaching uh, outreach work, uh, professional development leadership, um, publishing in the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, and uh, there is actually an LSA group currently focusing on uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning, but uh, uh, most linguists are, are not surprised when uh, they hear things that I heard as a, as a graduate student um, and as a professor uh, to ignore my teaching and just focus on research. Um, and uh, yeah, that kind of attitude is not good if you want to expand your discipline. Okay, so to, to conclude then, uh, in these times focusing on social justice, the discipline of linguistics has a chance to help in making real progress for linguistic justice. Um, while we urge others to take on, the, take on this type of work, we also need to recognize that without strong support from the discipline and buy-in from departments, the work is going to be much harder. Um, but given our suspect past regarding a, uh, uh, as a discipline uh, when it comes to race and uh, uh, issues of race, we have an ethical duty to start paying back communities that we've happily mined data for for generations uh, while uh, doing relatively little to improve the lives uh, of the people in these communities. And we have a real chance to do this now and to make a, a change if we choose to take it. All right, so there are the references and thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Um, maybe you can throw the, if you're willing, the whole entire slides up in the, um, in the chat and everyone will have the references for downloading that. Yep, I think uh, Poppy's uh, way ahead. Oh, you already did that? Oh, sorry. Okay, great. Um, let's just, there's some questions people put there. Sometimes they're artificial hand. There's also been some discussion in the chat quite a bit, actually. I don't know if it's so much questions as discussion, um, but let people put their hands up and ask, and you guys can take your own, can take your own questions. I don't want to have to, um, you can go ahead okay. and see. I'm sure you see them, so go ahead. Yeah, um, let's start with Alexander and then go to Polina. And folk, since you go to gallery view and put on your cameras now so we can all see each other while we have a discussion, that's what we prefer at the school. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi, um, I would like to ask uh, this question, and I know that uh, this is uh, a sensitive matter, uh, but and maybe there are uh, different views um, about this. So I don't remember exactly, but some years ago, there was uh, this uh, white author who wrote uh, a historical book, and uh, he or she uh, used a lot of um, uh, this uh, was a book about slavery, probably about the Civil War, and um, he or she used a lot of uh, African-American uh, vernacular English expressions, and uh, this uh, author tried to recreate uh, this, um, uh, this uh, language of uh, Black community at the time, and uh, this author was heavily criticized for being racist. Uh, because it was uh, perceived that, um, I mean, that um, this author does not have the capacity or the ability or like the moral right uh, to, to do so. And some, there was uh, this big discussion and some linguists and uh, also such like uh, African-American linguists such as John McWhorter, uh, Makwata, uh, he said that it is okay and he does not perceive it as racist and he thinks that it, it is right that, you know, there is no other way uh, to write uh, the book and uh, to um, re reproduce the speech uh, in any other way, but some uh, criticize. So 
what is your take on this matter so uh, uh, so if you uh, like don't don't write uh, books uh, if you don't think that you have like um, probably a moral right to do so or or try to do it more respectfully uh, I, I don't know what uh, how we can uh, resolve this so I, I would like to uh, hear about that thing okay I, I can uh, I can say a little something uh, about this um, so uh, I don't know if the book you were talking about was uh, the help do you remember uh, you know I'm not sure and yeah. probably I'm not even sure uh, whether maybe this uh, author messed something up so maybe uh, he or she did not pay uh, as much attention as should have been paid. Uh, I don't know. So probably that was uh, the matter and not that uh, the African-American uh, vernacular English was used. Uh, I don't know. So Yeah, so there was some con controversy about uh, a book called The Help. I can't remember who the author is. And then it was uh, eventually made uh, into a movie. Um, and uh, so uh, the author received criticism because uh, she used uh, African-American English, but incorrectly. In other words, uh, uh, she didn't really do her homework. Um, and uh, so there were errors. Um, so just like you can have a, an error in, you know, if you have so-called standard English, um, uh, uh, in, in, in your grammar, but uh, uh, she didn't, um, in other words, she didn't have an African American person or African American English person check the language. Uh, she just did it uh, herself, and uh, and there were mistakes. Um, now, if uh, uh, an African American person hands in a paper in their uh, class, in their English class, uh, and they use African American English, uh, they will they can get marked wrong. Um, but uh, this woman did not get marked. Uh, wrong at all, and on, on the other hand, she was uh, applauded uh, for uh, the uh, the work in the book, um, despite the fact that uh, her uh, her use of uh, of African American English in the book was uh, um, in some cases ungrammatical. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think the only thing I would say about that is that if you're using uh, a language that is not yours, that's from a community that's not yours, uh, you need to uh, maybe discuss it with um, people whose language uh, it is um, before you make mistakes like that. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so, Polina? Oh, uh, just, one, oh. just one thing. Uh, and the this uh, the help is discussed in in our references. There's Young et al. at the end, and in that book, uh, the 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 deal with the help is is uh, discussed. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, as a linguist, I I embrace uh, dialectal variation, uh, but also I know that if there is like no codification, no prescriptivism. So the languages diverge really fast. So I always perceive this like encouragement of kind of like learning of like common standardized language as means of like keeping language like dialects like from like divergence so that people can keep understanding each other because at for example, now we still kind of like it's still interlegible, but at some point, if if like prescriptivists don't keep it like similar, people just stop uh, being able to understand each other. So my question is like, to what extent do we have to like really embrace the variation and allow people like to freely use um what they use like at home in their normal life like in in the settings like uh, academic settings where like it's important for people like from different uh, regions from different dialects to understand each other um so that's sort of a um an as assumption that we've heard a lot 
And, uh, you know, eventually we have to really actually look into it because the thing is, I'm, I'm just, I'm not actually sure that that's true, right? The prescriptivists are sort of holding us together. I understand the, the logic behind it, right? But um, it seems that really isolation is what draws um, uh, varieties to be into being not mutually intelligible right? Um, more than actually prescriptive forces. So it's not clear to me that the prescriptivism is actually what's holding us together as much as, you know, communication. So if anything, with um, more ease of communication across regions, which we certainly have, have now, I mean, people always are sort of also speculating that, that mass media is, is reducing variation in, um, uh, um, and I, I also actually, I don't know that that's true either. These are, <laughs> these are some things I've sort of been, um, you know, have been on my mind to find out what's up with that. If any of you know more research on, uh, that I'd, I'd love, to, I'd love to know it. So uh, I can, I can, uh, jump in there. Yeah, so yeah, Lab Labov importantly showed that, you know, in the, the Northern cities chain shift, right. um, in it's, the U S you have, um, languages becoming more different from each other, not more, more similar. Um, and uh, so there, yeah. Right. Um, so I, I don't think it's prescriptivists that are holding us together um, as much as we might think. But, um, you know, Maria in, in the chat mentioned um, teaching English as a foreign language, which is another area where people are like, well, we need some kind of standard, right? And, um, you know, certainly it would be too much as, as someone who's taught English as a foreign language myself, right? Um, it would be insane to start out by teaching all varieties of English, right? That, that would be a huge, huge task. But there's still the way you talk about English variation, right? Is someone pronouncing an English word in a way that some variety of English does pronounce it? Hey, then you can say, okay, so you're pronouncing it in this, in this way, I pronounce it in this way, right? So you can acknowledge that difference instead of saying that's incorrect. But if someone's pronouncing a word in a way that no English speaker does, then you can say, hey, that's not a way to pronounce this word in English, right? Um, so in the way we correct students, there can still be an acknowledgement of difference and, you know, just more acknowledgement of English variation, right? So if an English student comes and uses, has, you know, been listening to music, music or watching TV and says, ain't, this actually happened to my sister. My sister is a French speaker and she um, used some uh, non-standard dialects in, in one of her papers and her professor um, in college corrected her on it and gave her a very bad grade. And I was like, this is a very colloquial and <laughs> her English is getting so good. I was so proud of her. Um, but her uh, professor was not pleased with her at all, right? So um, it could be just in uh, not necessarily what we teach, but how we accept variation in the classes, I would say. Um, uh, Nicole, I'm sorry if I... No, you got it right. <laughs> uh, so you have partially already answered my question. I was wondering about uh, teaching English as a foreign language. Uh, as a teacher, it's happening more and more in my class that especially teenagers use so-called non-standard English. Uh, and I'm always um, unsure whether I'm supposed to correct them or not. And I actually had a discussion with a colleague about this. And we were wondering, especially because they're heavily influenced by um, uh, African-American English, uh, where do we draw the line? Where that becomes a cultural appropriation in a way? So I think that's a part of the discussion we should also have. Carlos, do you want to? Uh, uh, well, I can say say something. Yeah, I mean, you. We should always worry about cultural uh, appropriation. Um, but uh, 
you can say you know hip hop language has spread around the the globe um so uh, it's all over uh the place um i think making students aware of differences is probably the best way to approach it you know you can the, whoever's learning uh as a second language learner uh you you can let them know what uh you know that there are differences um and you know to to try to do it in a non-judgmental way um but to to let them know that um you might have certain reactions in certain uh venues if you uh speak uh, a, a certain way not to you know prescribe to them but to just discuss ling language variation and make people aware of language variation um is helpful to them and discuss some of some of the the issues um and uh, it's it's ironic that you know we, we're all worried about standard English, but the actual variety of English that is traveling around the world most um, uh, is a version of African American English with a lot of young people around uh, around the world. Poppy, did you have something else for that? No, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. Thank you. I would just like to add very quickly uh, because I'm not a native speaker. I also always feel utterly unprepared to deal with variation of English because that's not something we learn. Even I'm an English major, but that's not something we talk about. It's not something we learn. So when we then face it in class, I, I really feel unprepared when it comes to that. And I think that would be great feedback in your program. I mean, I think, you know, certainly for starting out, it wouldn't make a lot of sense, but I think when we get to advanced language, advanced levels of language, right, um, we should have a lot more dialectal variation courses, right? Um, and that's a curriculum issue that could um, really benefit a lot of different programs, right? No matter whether, you know, it's it, for, for any language, any area of study, once you get to a certain level, like learning about dialectal variation in that language would be really, really valuable. Yeah. This, so this discussion just reminded me of a, a colleague uh, who was telling me who wanted to, who was trying to learn Japanese, um, but Japanese that you could use in on the street every day. And, you know, they kind of refused. No, you have to speak this Japanese. And, and uh, it turned out that it was a frustrating situation because um, my colleague didn't really learn the Japanese that she couldn't use it in her everyday life unless you know in a very you're in a very formal sort of uh, situation so knowing different uh, varieties is a is a beneficial thing um so uh yeah I think as you were saying Poppy making people aware of dialectal variation is is uh is important uh you above uh, thank you for this um, enlightening discussion. And my question, like, uh, is not, I'm not a linguist, so I'm really excited to hear uh, this, but I have a question regarding uh, Russian language. And maybe this is a similar field because in Russia, we have uh, feminist, uh, in feminist literature, we have a thing is like feminatives. So the words are used in masculine, um, have masculine like phase and and uh, the other thing is we, what what feminists try to use is to incorporate feminist uh, feminative uh, language uh, so for example like uh, after after so author is masculine after is author feminine and uh, the aversion to this language is um, i would say very strict in different uh, areas especially in academic language in journalism and uh, i think that this aversion doesn't shouldn't come from prejudice but i was wondering but this language is uh, ideologically really marked because it's a feminist language so what happens uh, here when some words mark uh, are markers of uh, political views for example uh, and so why it is so um div divisive between people and uh, when it stop, <laughs> when people stop fighting about feminatives. I have a feeling there are people here who are much 
better poised to address that question than Carlos or I. Um, but it's, I mean, it, it sounds similar to um, continuing issues of, of gender and language that are, are being discussed in, in um, most languages, right? A, a lot of language, any language that has any sort of gender, right? We're discussing um, how to make uh, language more inclusive, right? Um, right, Bronwyn mentioned uh, French in, in the chat and that's become, um, uh, and there's a big movement in French and in Spanish, absolutely. Um, and it, it's interesting because in a way uh, it's, there's sort of a, it's sort of a prescriptive movement, right? To, to prescribe a, a certain variety of a language. But um, on the other hand, it's, it's uh, attempting to, to make language more inclusive, right? And so it's in terms of inclusivity, I think, I think that it's getting pretty, the real question is just, can we um, get these things to take off? And I think that there's a lot of evidence that we can. I mean, the rise of singular they in English has been incredibly successful, right? And there were a lot of doubts about whether it would be incorporated into English because, you know, pronouns are a closed class, right? Um, and yet it, it's been very, very successful. So I think um, it, is, it is possible. Um, Bronwyn, yeah, it's a really interesting point about, about prescriptivism. Yeah. Is anyone else, I mean, does anyone know, have something more spe specific? Well, I guess we, we did use uh, Latinx in our presentation uh, as mm -hmm. well. So, uh, you know, and that seems to be taking off with a section of the population uh, as well. Um, but is also very controversial in in other uh, among lots of people. Oh, John, did you have something to answer there? No, I wanted to say that Yola was raising her hand, but now she oh, raised okay. her other hand. So I think it's on that issue. Not to jump ahead of Victoria, who was at her end up patiently, but on this same issue, I think Yola has something. Okay, great. Oh, Yola, you're you're muted. Sorry, hi, I was typing it up, but I figured I would just um, uh, uh, speak um, on um, Lugoyf's point um, that a, this has come up before in the discussion with a student that if I understand correctly that in um, Russian feminist discourse that adding a feminine gender to a noun gives it the, a noun that is gendered masculine, like biologist, for instance, um, gives it a feminist valence. But in the United States, taking away, and I don't, I don't know if it has to do with the kind of um, uh, class standing of the particular noun too, but, but for instance, like in the United States, if you refer to um, a server rather than a waitress that has a more feminist valence, right? Or if you refer to say, uh, you know, uh, refer to a flight attendant rather than a stewardess, but these are different words. I'm not have, um, thinking right now of, um, well, waiter, I guess waiter rather than waitress, like where you can have the same word, but take away the gendered quality. So then that's more kind of in line with they as, as a, um, a neutral uh, pronoun. And, uh, but then in Russia, it's interesting because it's a, in the Rus a Russian language, there are the three um, genders to the words. And so why is it how, like, yeah, how can we think, how do we understand this? Why, why is it that, that adding the gender um, creates that um, feminist space. And I was thinking, is this similar to what you were saying, Poppy, about how, um, you know, like uh, a, a given pronunciation in English has a certain, um, uh, elicits a certain negative attitude. And why does that same <laughs> pronunciation have a completely different attitude in the UK? Is that, would, would that be a model for, for thinking about this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, thank you so much. I knew somebody <laughs> who knows more about it. Thank you. Um, Victoria? I don't think we can hear you, Victoria. I can't hear you. you you're unmuted, but it's not working. If you have a microphone through headphones, I would suggest removing the headphones entirely, and then your computer will take care of it. Yeah. Those microphones are very unreliable. Or, or maybe type the uh, question in the in the chat, and we can address it. Sometimes when you put the microphone, the headphones into listen, the microphone that goes with them doesn't. Have so uh, I, I do see another question in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, uh, from uh, from John, uh, asking, could either of you share some of your thoughts on bi multilingualism or bi multi dialectalism relative to the vision of how to re rethink pedagogy across the board. I have the impression that there's a view out there that tries to rescue standardization notions as a kind of uh, promotion of bilingualism or bidialectalism, i.e. Uh, you have your home native system, but you should also know the standard. Have you encountered this attitude? Yes, so so this attitude is, uh, is prevalent uh, in much of academia, really. Um, so uh, where we th think of there's a um, different domains where languages are or are not acceptable. Um, and um, so uh, it has to do with what's called code switching, uh, which means change language depending on what situation you're you're in. Um, and yeah, we, we talk about that a lot. Um, and uh, the, the main takeaway that I take from, from code switching is that um, it puts an unfair burden on people who uh, are uh, speakers of a so-called non-standard uh, variety. Um, so uh, you have to go to school and you have to learn everything, but you have to do it in a language that isn't quite yours. And you have to express yourself in a language that's not uh, not yours. You have to always be thinking, which variety of language should I be be speaking, right? And why can't I speak my own variety of language? What's wrong with it? Um, according to linguistics, nothing is wrong with any varieties of, of language, um, but you're sending a message to speakers that, um, yeah, oh, your language is great, but it's not good enough for important things. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure, John, if that's what you were, were, were getting at. Um, but uh, yeah, you can pipe in if you want to. Yeah, Young et al. Um, reject code switching for the reasons that Carlos just um, just uh, articulated and embrace instead um, code meshing, right? Which <laughs> seems like just a, a, a you know a little variant, but is is the idea of of sort of learning both varieties but being able to use them together, right? And um, translanguaging is another alternative to code switching, um, which it embraces as a, someone's entire linguistic inventory, right? Um, and yeah, it's it's just the problem of of having um, an additional barrier, right? I had no linguistic barriers to education. My language was always accepted in education. Um, I didn't have to learn to speak a different way. It was just my my home language and that made it just all that much easier for me to succeed in school, right? As opposed to someone who has to um, go out of their way, often without any explicit instruction, to acquire an additional uh, dialect or language. Right. Yeah. I, um, hey, this is John. Um, oh, hey. Yeah, you, you, you were answering exactly, and that young was the direction I was going. Um, so I've had students uh, in classes read, um, you know, should writers use their own, they own English. Um, 
and uh, so that yeah, these kinds of things that you were you were saying, this is this is what I was aiming at. I just wanted to hear your thoughts about this. Yeah, we're right there. <laughs> Yeah, and and the idea with Young also is is not that um, in writing, it's not a case of everything anything goes right. You still have to what you know you can use your home dialect, but you still have to um, uh, make sure that your what you're writing is understandable, right? And you still have to um, maybe um, when you're putting in words, make sure that you might be using a word that you know, but someone else doesn't know. So you, you know, to, to clarify writing and, um, you can use the writing for, uh, to, you know, use your, your home dialect in there freely, um, because it's your, your voice. But again, it's, it's, it's not that, oh, we'll just accept anything, right? As a, as a writing teacher, you still have to worry if, you know, is the writing clear? Um, are you getting your point across, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but just excluding uh, one variety in, in arbitrarily, you know, if you're a linguist, you, you will think that it's an arbitrary dis decision on which variety is chosen to use uh, in, in a classroom. Um, but to not be able to use your full voice uh, is um, is is hurtful to to people and makes them not want to participate in in class. Um, and um, and then you'll turn on the TV. And I always use this example: if you're I don't know watching a game on TV and you turn on the TV. Um, probably a minimum of 50% of the advertisements you see will use um, African-American English in some way in, in them or African-American culture. So um, you say you can't use it in the classroom, but Madison Avenue can use it wherever they want. Um, uh, and they profit greatly uh, off of that. Um, DeAndre, is next and then we're also waiting to hear from uh, Victoria whenever they're able to. Hi, thank you so much. This was an excellent talk. Um, yeah, I guess I was curious about finding uh, maybe some sort of principle or rubric of some sort for working with various communities. I, I work with endangered languages in particular uh, in, in the South Pacific um, uh, and some also in Mexico. And one of the things that I've sort of faced, I also do sort of like language evolution type research and it, it gets really sticky when it's like you want to do sort of like cognitive or like language evolution type research in a smaller underrepresented language. Um, which I think is a good thing because you don't want those languages missing from that body of research. But there's also <laughs> a specter of a colonial history of let's go and test this out on X weird language. And the whole idea is it's because of the distinctiveness of that within that sort of colonial mind frame that you want to test that. And so it's, it's, a, it's a strange situation where it's like, you definitely don't want to be uninclusive and the situation is definitely that like cognition is pretty much all weird language weird languages weird societies but at the same time you don't want to be replicating that weird eugenics -y feel that was from the past and i'm curious to see if there's like a a principled way of of going about doing it ethically that you guys have come across at all so the forthcoming, unfortunately, it's not out yet. Maybe we can get um, you in touch with some authors who are working on this um, because the forthcoming book on decolonizing linguistics um, that we are talking about, those are some of the issues that they are talking about. Carlos and I aren't doing field research. So it's stuff we're reading about, but are not interacting with, right? Um, but it's definitely, one of the things that is being talked about and, and people are thinking about. Um, and Carlos, we, we have a list of all of the paper titles. So maybe we can find, we can reach out to some people and put you in touch with some people who are working on that, those issues in particular, if you'd be. Yeah, I think that's, that's possible. Let me, let me look. So you can answer questions for a while and I'll, I'll look uh, here. Yeah, because uh, those are exactly the kinds of issues that 
people are thinking about in decolonizing linguistics. Yeah, and it's a it's a big topic, um, uh, field work and and uh, and research in that sort of way. So, yeah. yeah. All right, let me find it now. Victoria has a oh, chat question in chat. When I started learning the English language as a second language, we were studying British English, but listening to songs and watching videos on YouTube, I discovered a lot of variations of English. And that was very confusing. As a non native speaker, I don't know what my English and the standard is good to study and to talk. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's a question of level, right? So starting out, certainly. Um, I think it would be bad in a first year foreign language of any language to um, start out right, right with a lot of different varieties, right? Um, maybe acknowledging varieties when they do come up, right? So in New York, we have a lot of Italian, Italian Americans, people of Italian heritage, um, and their um, Italian is mostly Sicilian, right? Or Southern Italian. And so they'll come into Italian classes because they want to learn Italian, which is the language of their heritage, though they don't speak it, right? And they will know some things, but they will know um, Sicilian pronunciations and phrases, right? Southern Italian pronunciations and phrases. And um, an Italian teacher can address that in two ways. They can say, are, that is incorrect, right? That is very wrong when they say things like, well, what are, what are some good, like mozzarella, mozzarella, I think is the sort of, sort of, that's the sort of New York Sicilian -y way pronunciation for mozzarella, which is my general American pronunciation of mozzarella, right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, but these kinds of pronunciations, they can either say that's wrong Right. Or they can say, oh, interesting. That's the Sicilian pronunciation. In this class, we're going to be focusing on a northern Italian pronunciation and using mozzarella. But you can use both. Right. So. Trying to focus on one variety. Right. Especially in early times, I think that that makes a lot of sense. But when you run into that variation, I think to say, as I saw in the chat, that's wrong. British English is the only English that is real, right? And somebody else responded, what British English though? Which is a great response, right? Um, but to, to just use it. And I, I, you know, if an English speaker hears you and says, are you even speaking British or, Ital or American English? What, are, what is this? Who cares about them? They, I'm sorry. This is being recorded. I shouldn't be so flippant, but that it just seems like an irrelevant sort of point if you're communicating well. Um, right, Alexander uh, in the chat says also that there's a good deal of mix, right? And what I always tell to my students who um, are non-native speakers of English, we, uh, Carlos and I teach public speaking and we have a lot of non-native speakers who are nervous about, um, you know, having, having an accent, right? Uh, betraying their non-nativeness in, in English. And what we always tell them is that the way they speak English tells a, tells a story, right? It tells a story of, of them and their experiences. And that's wonderful, right? So. Victoria's story is that of learning British English, but being exposed to American English and being a Russian speaker. And that's a great story to tell in your, in your voice. Can I, can you hear me? This is Diana. Hi, Poppy and Carlos. Hi. Hi. Hey. Uh, great to see you. Sorry, I can't have my camera on, but I have a quick question. Uh, I'm uh, teaching at Brooklyn College and uh, CUNY City University. And of course, a lot of my students speak the non quote unquote standard English. And I, of course, teach in accented English. Um, and I, this, I, this is an amazing project and what you're doing is really important. But I'm just um, speaking of stigma about different dialects. What about beyond education? Once the students are done with their education, they're entering the workforce, workplace, they, they'll be judged by their future employees, perhaps, because of the way that they speak and they've been encouraged to speak this way. So what can be done about the broader culture beyond 
just the education and institutions of education. So there, there are two things. One, Carlos and I often hear that as um, a reason to uh, teach standard English, right? We say we have to prepare our students for the workplace, right? We have to prepare them for, um, and this isn't what you were saying, but I, it, it just made me think of it. And it's, it's such a common thing. I, I have to, to, to address it, um, that, you know, we have to prepare our students to experience linguistic discrimination outside, right? And therefore we should arm them with standard English, right? And, that is poorly reasoned for, for a couple of reasons, right? One, when people experience other forms of discrimination, we generally don't tell them to change themselves rather than change the problem, right? Um, and two, um, most approaches to teaching or enforcing a standard language do not have the effect of um, helping students acquire the standard. Right. So the sort of red pen approach doesn't help students learn standard English. It just turns them off from education and makes them shut up. Right. So um, that's that's the address to to the question you didn't ask, but which is related to the one you did ask that we hear a lot. Carlos, are you still looking at stuff? Should I keep going or did you want to? Uh, I will be back with you in like. 30 seconds. And for the question you actually did ask, um, which is uh, dealing with linguistic discrimination on the wider, in the wider um, world, I think it's on linguists to get loud, right? Get loud on campuses, get loud elsewhere. We have been pretty quiet about this, right? Okay, we, oh, not all, there are plenty of linguists who have been very loud about this for a long time, right? But as a field, this hasn't been our sort of outwards thing that we've been screaming about. There isn't sort of an outward thing that we've been screaming about, I, I don't think. Um, and <laughs> thanks, Jana. Yeah, right. So um, we're, Carlos and I keep kind of running around to these conferences, just trying to encourage linguists to get loud about it, get loud about it on your campus, right? Linguistic discrimination is happening on your campus in other departments. Go talk to them, go get loud about it. It's in your assessment rubrics. It's a part of your institution. Um, and we just hope that people will get louder about it um, everywhere, and especially linguists with larger platforms than Carlos and I have, um, will start to make this uh, a focus of their approach. And, and we do see that it is starting, and that's our that's our hope. Yeah, I can also say that that some people are are doing some community work uh, as well, and uh, and you can even uh, get your students to to get out there and do this sort of thing you know I've, i had i've had students who take my linguistics class tell me how they're they're going to their family and talking about the information that that, that i'm giving them about uh, variety so so by hitting the students they do a lot of them do go out and talk uh, talk about this uh, as well but there are also i i believe in the in the volume as well there's there's probably uh a paper i think on uh including uh uh community kind of based projects so it's not just the uh um you know you interacting with the students but getting the students to to do presentations in the in the uh, community uh, as well oh and and uh yeah deandre I, I put something in the chat um the name of the the person ignacio montoya and uh what he's working on. So you might send him an email and and, uh, and uh, see uh, if he can point you in the right direction for some of this. Because the, the talk is about dealing with indigenous communities or the paper is about dealing with uh, indigenous communities in an ethical way. Um, and let's see, great discussions happening in the chat also. We I, We're, out of time, I think, technically, but 
I I'm fine to keep chatting. Um, yeah, it's a sign of sign of great interest. Um, and you're welcome to keep chatting. I think what we should do is stop the recording, but continue to talk as long as people want to. Um, and um, also ask you if we can share the recording.